Uh, then my oldest sister, Escaline Pardue, at the time, um, uh, I had taught for four years I was there, and I, I was on my best behavior at that stage. Uh, then uh, uh, Ms. Mullins taught. Uh, uh, there is a little anecdote associated with that. We all left there and went to a combined junior high school, high school um, in Chapmanville, West Virginia. We were bused probably roughly 10 miles. Actually, we, we all walked a mile and a half to get to the bus, uh, uh, unpaved road, and then caught a bus uh, several miles to Chapmanville High. Interestingly, uh, our homeroom teacher told us that the first round of exams there, there were five of us went, and the five of us were right at the top of, of that first round of exams. I'm not sure how it went after that, but uh, fairly interesting uh, observation. Nevertheless, uh, after uh, uh, grade school, um, uh, we went, uh, started the seventh grade at uh, Chapmanville Junior High High School combined. Um, some of the teachers there who had a really important impact on me was um, uh, Mr. Radcliffe, uh, who taught math and was our basketball and football coach. Uh, J.B. Straley taught science and uh, was uh, really very enthusiastic about chemistry in particular. Um, then uh, had, they had an outstanding uh, English department there, primarily, uh, staffed primarily by a, a Ms. Workman and Ms. Dowd, and uh, probably uh, 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 the math background, the science background leaving there was weak, but we had a very, very strong uh, English uh, uh, language program mm -hmm. uh, and uh, grammar, that sort of thing. Uh, the early years, let me just back off a little bit. During, during those early years, until uh, just before I went to high school, we had no electricity where I lived. We heated our house with uh, coal and so on. Wow. Uh, there wasn't much to do except read, so I read every book I could find. And, and uh, uh, my parents belonged to a, it was called a Book of the Month Club. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, they weren't classics, but they were well written. I learned a lot about grammar, sentence structure, and that sort of thing from that, combined with the English program at, at Chapmanville High. I came out with, uh, I think, pretty good ability to handle the English language, and um, that has served me well, so I, I give kudos to, uh, to those folks. Mm -hmm. uh, Very nice. Uh, as far as the um, activities are, are concerned, uh, I was in, a, it was called a key club, um, kind of a, uh, uh, a, a societal type, type of club teaching us to be good citizens. Uh, uh, business people in the area. Uh, we uh, we youngsters met with uh, with professional business people in the area, and that was a good experience. I played some basketball. Um, we had some very good basketball teams. Fortunate, though. Actually, we we played in two state championship games. Um, uh, West Virginia lost both of them, but uh, we played them anyhow. Mm -hmm. Football was another story. We were just starting the program when I was a freshman. Or I, 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 I be called a freshman now. I was I was in ninth grade, and uh, we started football. I don't remember. Um, well, I, I remember getting together at uh, reunions and people talking about the games we won. I was trying to remember games in which we scored. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny what you remember, right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> what the recall comes back. <laughs> and, uh, uh, track, I was a pretty good miler. In fact, I competed in a state mile uh, one, run once. I didn't win, but I competed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of it. For, I was president of our senior class, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I was on the student council, of course, and, and things of that nature. So um, it, that was a, uh, a rewarding experience. Um, what was the size of your class approximately, do you uh, recall? Roughly, I'd say roughly 70 people. Wow. that's You really got to, well, um, you bond with them, but also some of them came from grade school. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. Uh -huh. Yes, it was a really good bonding experience. I, um, uh, my memory doesn't permit me to remember all the names, but I do recognize the, the, the faces and the characteristics of people. Sure. That was a, a really, really uh, good experience. Um, 
some of the folks went on to uh, to uh, college, some some didn't. Uh, there's a tendency at that time for young people from that area in particular to uh, go to places like Cleveland. Cleveland was a hot spot uh, on the docks there. And uh, uh, so uh, some went on to college, some, some didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. um, after that, I, um, I, my memory is that I uh, graduated high school on, uh, on um, May the 26th or 27th and started college at Marshall's, Marshall College at the time, now University in Huntington, West Virginia, on June the 2nd. So wow. Week. Wow. Um, uh, at that time, they were offering young people like myself all expense paid trips to Southeast Asia. Um, that's when the Korean War was uh, was going on. And sure. I was, I was trying to get in as much college. I didn't didn't want to get a deferment, but I was trying to get in as much college as I could. And as a matter of fact, I was uh, I was able. I I went winter and summer, completed my uh, program of BS in chemistry at Marshall in three years. Stayed on there for a a uh, master's degree. People there who had uh, the uh, principal impact on me were uh, a, a math professor by the name of Barron who, my math background was, was weak. He, he taught algebra and kind of brought me up to speed on that. Um, uh, the head of the chemistry department, A.W. A. Scholl, was very instrumental in, in uh, encouraging us to go on to after that. A young professor named John Wolzon, um, uh, just fresh out of, of Penn State, uh, uh, kind of kept us on our toes, uh, and then uh, an older professor, John Hoback, Professor Hoback, taught general and, and physical chemistry, a very, very good teacher, and uh, had, a, had a major impact uh, on me. As I say, I got uh, uh, BS and MS degrees there. I, I didn't participate, really did not participate in any extracurricular activities at Marshall. I was, I arranged my classes so I could uh, leave uh, Hunt Huntington about oh, sometime early afternoon on Friday, uh, hitchhike back home, south home, and work on the farm for the weekend, and then okay. hitchhike back. Sure, on, okay. On so busy schedule you had. Very busy schedule, sure. yes. Uh, I gather you lived on campus then during the week? Well, I oh. lived with, uh, no, I did not. Oh. I, I had brothers and sisters who lived in the area. I lived with a sister for a couple of years and lived with a, a brother for a couple of years. And then eventually, um, when I had a brother who, who in fact was in uh, Korea, when he came back, he and I got an apartment together. He and I and a younger sister uh, uh, got uh, had an apartment together for a while. So well, it, uh, that worked out. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never really had a dorm experience. Uh, mm. I think that, uh, that, uh, that could be good or bad, I guess. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if, if I'm going into too much detail... No, 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 uh, go ahead. You're you know, fine. Sure. Um, there's one person that I want to mention. Uh, when I left the farm, I had practically no social skills to talk about. I met a young man my very first day in, in, at Marshall by the name of Bobby Richardson. Uh, Bobby went on, ultimately became a dentist, but he kind of took me under his wing, and his family fed me a lot. We, Bobby and I studied together, and uh, I ate a lot of uh, a lot of nice lunches at his house. And so I, I just must mention him. In, Good. In, in this, and he and I, we lost contact for a while, but we have gotten together again. And we, and any time either one of us is in the, the in West Virginia, we let the other know, and we try to get. Together. Okay, uh, then uh, after that, um, I uh, was admitted to the graduate program at the University of Illinois. Uh, went there to study analytical chemistry, which I did. Um, and that, it was a, it was a four-year period at Marshall, three years for the BS, and then a year I stayed on for a master's degree there. Um, then went on to the University of Illinois, um, where I did my uh, doctoral work in analytical chemistry. Uh, that was a, turned out to be a four-year program. The two people there who had uh, the major impact on my life were my major professor, Howard Malmstadt, and, uh, and Herb Leibman. Um, 
Professor Malmstadt had been in the Navy, had taught electronics in the Navy, and was very much into instrumentation. I ended up working for him, and, and it was on that basis. My, my own primary interest then turned out to be um, chemical instrumentation. Um, uh, not the big stuff like mass spectrometers and MRs and so on, but automation of, uh, of measurement processes I'll talk about uh, in a while. But uh, I had had two electronics courses at the undergraduate level, and I wondered why, as a chemist, uh, they were requiring me to take these courses. But they, they served me very well uh, when I got there. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I digress just a little bit. I use that experience in, in, in my, my teaching because when you are an undergraduate, you, many of the courses you must take, you have no idea what, uh, why, they, why you're taking them. But having had those courses in electronics, I was prepared to get started fairly quickly sure. uh, in, my, in what I ultimately ended up with my graduate research. research. Um, so I completed a doctoral degree there working with Howard Malmstadt. Uh, we began to look at uh, how one could use kinetic features of, uh, or transient features of chemical reactions for quantitative determinations. Um, and um, um, that would combine the use of enzymes um, for as selective reagents for uh, for components in blood such as glucose, cholesterol, bilirubin, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and we were trying to automate those those procedures. Um, they they were very aw awkward at the time. Uh, this was just at a point when. Uh, electronic devices uh, capable of, of uh, automating such measurements, capable of doing calculations, were becoming available. So it was you know, just a matter of, of timing, really, as a lot of things are. Uh, so um, I went to Purdue University, uh, joined the faculty there, the analytical group at Purdue, uh, as part of the chemistry department in 1961. Okay. How, did the, how did that uh, appointment come about? Did, were they doing some recruiting or? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, yes. Uh, they needed someone in uh, in analytical chemistry. There may have been a. Uh, I think that they had just lost a uh, professor by the name of Warren Bryant, who had gone to another institution, and uh, they were looking, I think, to replace him. And yes, they they were recruiting. Um, uh, my professor Molstadt, uh learned of this and. Uh, uh, arranged, uh, uh, I applied and was given an interview and ultimately uh, was offered a position and, and accepted it. And uh, that is one of the really um, uh, oh, fortunate uh, experiences in my life is because this program ultimately um, uh, was ranked for probably 40 years as the top program in analytical chemistry in the United States, uh, and, and I had tremendous support from the, from the department there throughout my career, so uh, that was a very lucky event. Very, very fortunate then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, were you married at that time? Yes, I was. Okay. Yes, uh, I was married um, just before I left Huntington for to go to uh, the University of Illinois. Okay. Uh, my wife joined me sometime after I arrived there. Okay. So now we're in La. Where did you live? Uh, where, where was housing like when you came? Oh, to the University of Illinois. Yeah, no, to uh, Purdue. Oh, oh, to, to Purdue. Yeah. Um, this is in the early '60s. Was, yes, housing was scarce. Hel mm. Housing was scarce at, at that time, unlike today. Um, at the time, the university had uh, some. Um, uh, uh, yeah, they, I'm pretty certain these were university buildings out on David Ross Road. Okay. Uh, that's. Uh, there were probably 15. Uh, these were some of the earliest national homes that were, had been built, and they were on a little circle called uh, David Ross Road. It was a beautiful area. It was kind of um, uh, inserted in uh, between uh, fairways on the golf course. Okay. So it's just really, really pleasant. It wasn't unusual to have a golf ball bounce off a, <laughs> off a uh, tree and into your window. And as a matter of fact, right. we had rabbit wire. They put rabbit wire on the windows and back <laughs> from these little round balls. <laughs> it, 
it, it, it, it, was, it was pleasant housing. Then we eventually moved from that. They did move those houses, and we moved down onto uh, Evergreen Street okay. uh, for a while, and then uh, we were able to scrape together enough shekels to buy a home on uh, uh, Hillcrest Road. Okay, okay. Let's talk a little about your research, the analytical chemists. Tell us about that. Well, um, analytical chemists, uh, uh, or analytical chemistry, basically, for, and the way I see it, it provides the concepts and tools that people in other areas, analyst, analysts as well as people in other areas use to identify and quantify uh, components in, in the materials that surround us, um, the plastics we use, the water we drink, the and blood in our, our body fluids and that sort of thing. Um, there were two or three aspects uh, that I was particularly interested in. As I mentioned earlier, the use of kinetics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can, a chemical reaction will move at some rate toward an equilibrium uh, condition. And we were trying to figure out better, best ways to use the kinetic information. There's a lot of information content there, and uh, our idea was to try and extract as much of that as possible. Not so much to study the kinetics and, and mechanisms of the reactions, but to use that to quantify components in body fluids. Um, that leads to the second area of interest. I had become interested in uh, clinical chemistry at the time, and so mm -hmm. a lot of my work, most of the examples I chose were, were relevant to uh, clinical chemistry. In a more general sense, I was interested in, in, in instrumentation in general, small automated instrumentation in general. For example, we, uh, uh, one of the problems with uh, kinetic-based methods is that you don't have much signal with which to work. And uh, we uh, developed some very, very stable uh, uh, photometer systems to, uh, to meet that need. Uh, uh, so it was a matter of, of uh, trying to automate some of uh, these uh, procedures that prior to that had been very, very cumbersome to use. Okay. Uh, it might, might take, uh, put it in perspective, it might take a half hour uh, to do the experiment in a clinical lab. We were trying to do it in 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, that, that's I understand. Good. Uh, so Technology was beginning to play a, an assistant in a role as, as the field moved on. I, I beg your pardon? The technology was uh, uh, provided tools as it moved forward. That's right, exactly. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the timing was just right for this. Sure. Because there had, there had been, there were developments in electronics, um, uh, a, a, a component called operational amplifiers. I won't explain that, but it, um, they could do analog, they could do mathematical calculations. They could do control functions. So the t it was as much a matter of time as it was in, in interest and in timing as it was uh, interest and, uh, and knowledge. Uh, right. Those tools just hadn't been, been available. It's, it's, it's kind of like what we've seen in the, in, in the progression of computers from the ILIAC at the University of Illinois that filled a room to, uh, to uh, little tiny computers I have sitting on my desk here. So uh, There you go. <laughs> Remember the days of the deck and the cards and all that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Many have shared those remark comments as well. <laughs> but, but they were powerful. Oh, yeah. At the time, they were powerful. There is, is an interesting anecdote here. The computers that I bought, when we first got into the computer age in the uh -huh. story, we paid a dollar a word for computer memory. So you, you get a computer with 50,000 words of memory, you pay $50,000 for it. Um, and now, <laughs> huh. I, I won't do the division to get the cost of word of, of memory. That's but, right. uh, I hear you. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, you want to talk a little bit about when uh, being head of the chemistry department? Oh, May yes. Okay. Yes. Why don't we I'm, talk a little bit about that? And you, re a you replaced uh, Dr. Marjorie. That's right, yes. yes. Okay. I came in after, after he did. Um, um, that was not some, and I'll, I'll be honest up front about that, that was not something um, that I was particularly enthusiastic about doing. I, I shouldn't say it that way, particularly interested in doing. Once I decided to do it, I was enthusiastic sure. about it, but 
I was more interested in teaching and research uh, than in administration. I really hadn't had much experience. There was a tremendous learning curve to climb, and you didn't have much time to, uh, to, to climb it. Um, the principal challenges we faced at the time were space utilization, um, replacement of, of faculty. We lost some really good faculty to other institutions, strong faculty to other institutions, and um, uh, trying to retain the, the, the faculty. And um, it, it wasn't difficult. The department has a good reputation around, the, strong reputation around the country. Mm -hmm. It wasn't difficult to identify candidates that were interested. The biggest problem that I faced is, is what we call setup money. Let me just explain, if no one has mentioned that, let me explain that briefly. Virtually no two chemists use the same kinds of instrumentation. Um, uh, they, uh, I shouldn't put it just exactly that way, but many of the chemists that we that were trying to hire uh, needed specialized instrumentation, and this instrumentation could cost uh, several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And it was a major task to, to find those dollars. The university wasn't flush with money at the time, and so I spent probably as much of my time as anything trying to flush out uh, funds for this instrumentation to set people up. Uh, one of the people that we lost was a uh, was a uh, an NMR uh, specialist, and uh, we needed to replace the NMR instrumentation. A, a second person we wanted to hire also needed NMR. So, um, in order to give us some time, I I, I worked uh, an arrangement with uh, Great Lakes Chemical, where they helped us upgrade some of our NR, NMR instrumentation, and in exchange, they got time on the instrument. So uh, those are the kinds of ways that we mm -hmm. try to solve those, those problems. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it wasn't always easy to explain to the upper administration why uh, the instrumentation that one mass spectroscopist or one NMR specialist used wasn't satisfactory yeah. to the next person. That uh, took a lot of, a lot of time and effort. Right. A lot of talking and, dis and discussion. That's right. Right, so yeah, right. <laughs> but we were successful in hiring some very, very good people who since have moved on, I think. But uh, I mentioned David Gorenstein and Dale Bumber as two of, two of those. All right, oh, good. The, um, you, you was, was it during your time that Industrial Associates program was established? Uh, actually, it was uh. in effect. Dale Marjoram was primarily responsible for establishing okay. the Industrial Associates Program, so he gets the kudos for that. I, I participated in the program. Sure, okay. Okay. Um, one thing I was going to ask uh, about um, that Amy Mellon lecture series, that, was that during your tenure? That yes. started? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, no, it okay. started uh, before my tenure. Okay. Uh, a bit of background on that. Because uh, uh, I met Dr. Mellon a couple of times before he passed on. Uh, John Penzelic had invited, he was in the library, and I, I got, did get a chance to chat with him. Yeah. He was a wonderful gentleman. He, mm -hmm. is, he, he um, is, was pretty much the father of analytical chemistry at Purdue. He came, initiated, uh, he did his doctoral work at Ohio State University came and uh, initiated a program in analytical chemistry and eventually specialized in, in uh, spectroscopy. And he sort of started the program. And he was a mentor for me, one of my mentors when I, when I arrived at, at Purdue. Uh, Dr. Amy um, did his graduate work, uh, PhD work, at Purdue, stayed on, and started uh, what is an instrumentation facility, a facility designed uh, to, to, to assist chemistry faculty and graduate students with their instrumental problems, things like mass spectroscopy, uh, NMR, uh, infrared spectroscopy, chrom chrom chromatographic separation methods, uh, 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 et cetera. Mm -hmm. It was more than just, here's a problem, solve it for us. It was a teaching tool. Uh, he. Uh, Dr. Amy would not, or would he let any of his other people just solve a problem for a person. The person had to 
uh, convince him they understood what the problem was, what they needed, and help with the solution. So it was a, not only was it a service in terms of providing and supporting instrumental uh, instrumentation, but it was a teaching tool, and, and that ha that had an, a major impact on our our graduate students in particular. They mm -hmm. were in demand all over the country because of this. So. So, but the Amy, the Amy Mellon series was met, named for the, those folk, and I honestly don't remember when it was initiated. Uh -huh. most, of our, most of our speakers... It said around 1984, I think. Okay. Yeah, okay. I looked That's up something. Um, or thereabouts. I, well, it Might have been a, in, in that... Then, it, okay. I'm, I beg your pardon. My memory may have failed me because I was head of department at the yeah. time. Yeah, okay. It, it, that is the case. Um, Somewhere around that, it, yeah, it yeah. might have been in, inaccurate. The source that I had from the uh, article. It's very, it's very possible. Mm -hmm. um, and now that you mentioned, I can say yes, but uh, I, I'm not certain. Of that. Sure. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, in uh, one of the things, in, in when you were the head of the department, you talk a little about how was di diversity. Was that um, in uh, or how did you cover that recruitment and diversity, et cetera? Well, for the students? yes, we, yeah, we, sure. are, we, we obviously wanted to get the best faculty, uh, best, best people possible. We also wanted a, a diverse uh, sure. faculty. Um, uh, uh, it, the department, when I arrived there, I think was uh, total, totally Caucasian, uh, totally, uh, with one exception, there was one woman on the faculty, and we were trying to obviously to find good people in, in all, all of the right. uh, uh, race. Uh, we did not want race or gender to be a factor, and in fact, uh, it, it is, I'm pretty sure it isn't now. So. Right, right. Were you ever a faculty fellow, Dr. Pardue? Yes, and I was. Oh, I okay. Was uh, I was faculty fellow at uh, Harrison Hall for many years. Okay. Uh, Joanne Halsmer. Joanne Halsmer, one of, one of the students in a general chemistry class that I taught, invited uh -huh. me to, to me, and uh, that was a really delightful. Yes, experience. yeah. I've been a fact fellow over at, uh, at Tarkington, and I've, I've enjoyed it very much. Mm. Uh, it's, it's an amazing experience to yes. have an opportunity to talk with students right. in that uh, format, yes. Um, do you want to make a couple comments on some of the rewards that you got? Uh, Certainly some that you've received at like the ACS, Analytical Chemistry Division's Chemical Instrumentation Award, and the Arthur E. Kelly Outstanding Teacher Award. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Let me okay. start with the, okay. uh, with the teaching awards. Okay. I'm, probably those are... are uh, and you're a fellow in the I, Teaching Academy, which is great. That is, that is correct, yes. Super. I, I won the Arthur E. Kelly Award, that's for in 90, 1992 and 2001. Uh -huh. That's an outstanding teacher chemistry department uh, by the student body in chemistry. Um, uh, the best freshman professor by Alpha Lambda Delta. I believe that was in engineering. Uh, this mm -hmm. was for my teaching in general chemistry. Uh, that was in 92. Um, I was named top ten, one of the top ten teachers in the School of Science several years running in the uh, 90s. Um, I did win the Outstanding Teacher in the School of Science Award 2001. Uh, that Very was nice. By the uh, Science Student Council. And uh, as you mentioned, I was appointed a fellow in the, in the teaching mm -hmm. academy. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my, my teaching there. I was an awful teacher when I started. Um, at, at the freshman level, I taught, uh, sen I was pretty good at senior and, uh, and uh, graduate levels. I really didn't know how to walk into Weber 200, 400 people, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, teach. Uh, I could I could present the material. That was no problem. But I'll get back to that later if we have some. Well, go, no, go ahead. Make a couple comments. Follow up, follow up on that. That's fine. Um, on the teaching, I was going to ask you a little bit about that. The like I just said, it's very easy for any of us to walk into a room and, and present the technical material in our area. The big challenges are the big challenge is to get the students interested and uh, you need to do some special things to uh, to let them know that you're interested in in them and that you're uh, uh, you not only have to be really interested you have to let them them know that 
Uh, one of the things, uh, when I was teaching in general chemistry, for example, I'll, I'll just give you one an anecdotal story there. Most of the people in Chemistry 116 that I was teaching were considered themselves future engineers. And they couldn't understand why they were being required to take chemistry. Some of them thought that their ancestors had done something really, really bad and they were being punished for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I, uh, one of the things, I, I wanted them to know that uh, I felt their pain, I understood their pain, because as I told you earlier, I had been forced to take electronics courses myself, and I didn't understand why they were forced. <laughs> and because, partially because of those electronics courses, I, I traveled all over the world talking about instrumentation. Mm -hmm. um, and I shared that with them, but one of the things that I would do to, to start the class uh, to help them understand that I felt that I understood their pain, I would start off and ask them, um, tell them I wanted to find the one word that described how most people in the room felt about chemistry. Instead of asking them, I had some transparency. And I would start off with uh, words that they were throwing around, oh, chemistry is awesome, chemistry is excellent, chemistry is outstanding. I, I tell them I had an applause meter up in front. <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing. Occasionally, chemistry major would would applaud, but they'd throw him out. And I mumble around for a while, and then I, I would put up a, uh, a transparency that says, uh, chemistry sucks. And, and the room would just go wild. So all of a sudden here, here was somebody that understood how they felt about <laughs> chemistry. And I, you hit I, home. <laughs> yeah, I would tell them, of course, uh, you know, I'm kidding, but I know you're not. <laughs> and, and we, so I had them for a few minutes at least. Another thing that I did, um, I, I discovered myself listening to lectures, and, and I think a lot, this will be useful to a lot of people, I discovered myself listening to lectures on topics with which I was not thoroughly familiar. I could really concentrate, if it was a good speaker, I could follow for 20 minutes or a half hour, but then I got tired. I got tired and my mind wandered and it was hard to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I told the kids that if you will listen to me, 20, 21, 22, 25 minutes, something like that, um, when I find a convenient place, we'll take a break and uh, let you rest your minds, talk to each other, whatever. Then I realized I had slides from around most of the world, and so I started bringing in three or four or five or six slides and taking them on a little trip during this two or three minute period. And they really enjoyed that. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. That's a good, that's a nice slide. That's nice broaden their horizons and so on, and I, and I invited them to do the same thing, and occasionally uh, some would bring in uh, a few slides from one of their trips. I have people bring in slides from Australia and uh, from Italy. So uh, at any rate, that's, those are some of the uh, techniques I use to, uh, to choose. It, isn't that appropriate what, you're, what you did? Because uh, you may not uh, have been back, but you know where the teaching, where the plaque is for the teaching academy? They have the flags around the world for all the international, for every, all the countries that are represented by our international students. Mm -hmm. They're on the top of the wall, all around there, which is really nice. That is, that is, that it is. It just works out perfect, you know. It's a, just a nice thing to, it's a good location for it. Yeah. Of course, uh, I, had, I had explained to, to, the, to my class about this uh, uh, affluent uh, background from which I had come, and by, you know, by working hard, uh, uh, not particularly intelligent really of the people, I just worked very hard, and uh, that this had opened up all these opportunities to travel, and I think that really inspired. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it does. That's right. <laughs> One other thing, I want, uh, going back to the awards, I want to, uh, they, when you retired, they had an all-day symposium yes. in, uh, which, in, uh, and then a gift to the Division of Analytical Chemistry. That sounds very nice. A nice, yes, a, a nice pro, a nice touch. That was very nice. It was wonderful. Um, one of my former graduate students who was uh, uh, who attended that uh, uh, came. He and his wife came up from uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area to visit us about three weeks ago. Uh -huh. he, had, he had made a uh, had, had filmed, uh, say filmed, but on a CD, excerpts from that, and that was really, really uh, a, a nice touch for me. Anyway, uh, Very nice to have. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can you talk a little about your family? Do you have any children? Did, and if so, did they come to Purdue? Or? Yes, uh -huh. I have, um, I have uh, 
uh, uh, my current wife and I uh, put together two families, a son uh, from, uh, adopted son from my first uh, uh, marriage, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Purdue. He got a degree in uh, uh, computer science from Purdue and uh, did most of the work for a uh, uh, master's in industrial management, um, uh, didn't, didn't uh, industrial engineering type management, didn't complete that. Um, uh, we had two sons, uh, Mary brought two sons into the uh, family, um, Brian and Michael. Brian uh, did a program in uh, English, uh, in English uh, in, at Purdue with uh, emphasis on women's studies, went on to Indiana University and got a master's degree in uh, uh, journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael uh, did not attend college, he's, he's, um, he's gotten degrees at, uh, at, at Ivy Tech. Mm -hmm. Did not attend Purdue, no. So okay, sounds good. Um, let's. We're sorry. Uh, how about uh, retirement activities? Oh. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. A few hours. Um, actually, I'm continuing to write. Kathleen. Okay. Uh, I'm. Uh, one of the reasons I retired when I did was to get time uh, to um, uh, to do some writing. I'm writing on a textbook for analytical chemistry. It's going well, but very slowly. My, my last few years at Purdue, I had an opportunity to teach in our junior level analytical course. Um, it was a little bit out of date, so I, I updated the, some of the experiments, and I'm, I'm writing about some of those experiences. Oh, so good. I, I, you know, I usually you know, I spend a good bit of the day uh, at the computer writing. Um, my wife and I like to garden. Um, uh, we have an, it's a beautiful, beautiful area here to, uh, to grow raspberries. Marion berries, et cetera. We have a nice garden with lots of berries, and mm. official vegetables, and so on. We we still follow a walk behind mower around about an acre and a half of grass, or an acre of grass, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, um, those are those are kind of my uh, sounds good. My activities. I really really enjoying uh, retirement. I, I uh, the traffic I have to fight is only that on the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> from my breakfast table to the, the office. So uh, it's so, very nice. So sounds yeah, sounds good. Yeah, nicely rounded. Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Oh, I'd, I'd have to go with uh, the Saturday football, I think. There you go. Yeah. I'm with you on there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I enjoy basketball and, and football there, but uh, I think the Saturday football is it. With Russ A., there you go. How about an outstanding event? You know what? I've been thinking about that, and there are lots of them. Uh huh. Uh, a couple. Five, That's fine. Uh, adopting a son, adopting the two stepsons, um, the birth of grandchildren. I have. I didn't mention uh, Nick, Phil, and uh, Madison. Have three grandchildren. Okay. But I'm going to tell you about a, a, an experience I had. My first trip ever to Europe. Okay. Uh, that, uh, that's the first thing I thought of when I saw this on your note, and. Uh, uh, so I'm going to go with that. I've been invited to give a series of lectures around uh, Italy, and we were in Milan, Italy. I was the guest of a rather large company there called Carlo Urba. They make chemical instrumentation. I'm going to give a lecture that evening. They took us out to a nice, a nice dinner, and I have the perception or the impression that they had somehow purchased the, the, the grounds of an area that, had, that and buildings of an area that had once been a, a church. And uh, when we went in to give, when I went in to give the lecture, I walked into this lecture hall and it was a domed ceiling. I, I think it had to have been a chapel at one time. Mm -hmm. On the ceiling were these Michelangelo type paintings. I'm not saying Michelangelo did this, this uh, these paintings, but they're very, very similar uh, to um, others you'd see around the churches in, in, in Italy. And so that was both an exciting and a humbling experience. Oh, I bet. Awesome. So uh, I'd like to have had photographs from that, but that yeah. wouldn't have been proper. Anyway, you got the photograph in your mind, and that's good. That's right. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave. Uh, let you make some closing comments or anything that's something I forgot to ask, or I'll leave it up to you. Well, uh, yes, I will... Um, uh, I'll just say we didn't talk much about uh, 
teaching awards, but okay. to me, the teaching aspect of my uh, time at Purdue was just as important as to me as my research. Good I point. I enjoyed it. Um, I had such a, a wonderful rapport with a lot of people there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you about, uh, uh, I won't call it a award, it was an honor that my graduate students gave me okay. one time. I, I have it sitting here on my desk. It's uh, in 1977. Uh, it's a nice, uh, about an eight inches tall wooden, uh, uh, you know, the, the usual wooden plaque type thing with a metal plaque on it. Okay. And it says, you're number one, Harry. <laughs> and mounted on top of that is the south end of a horse going north. So <laughs> <laughs> they really respect, I don't know who to <laughs> I, <laughs> I really cherish that little award. Uh, seriously, the, um, there could not have been a better opportunity, a better group of faculty and students with which to work. I cherish my the time I spent in the Department of Chemistry and on campus right. at, at Purdue. It was just an absolutely wonderful experience. I feel as if I am one of the most fortunate people in the world. All right. I thank you very much. This concludes it. I thank you very much. And we have a couple comments you were going to make, so I'll turn off the recorder. All right. Thank, thank you. you.